Greetings fellow Gorehounds and welcome back to a Blood Splattered Vlog, I'm the Horror Guru and today we're going to talk about the brand spanking new Shudder Original Violation. Now because of the very special nature of this specific film, I'm going to do something I don't normally do in these reviews and that's this. I'm going to issue a couple warnings first. With the first warning being, as if the title of the movie didn't give it away, Violation is a rape revenge film, and given the fact that it is a rape revenge film, that means it features those two very things. That also means it's a film that deep dives into trauma, and it doesn't sugarcoat that aspect the least bit. On top of that, Violation is also an art house film that features many visual metaphors involving animals. And these visual metaphors are particularly graphic and include images of things such as animals eating other animals in slow motion. In fact, those images specifically reminded me a lot of the movie Antichrist to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. And my final warning is, Violation also happens to be an incredibly slow burn. And I say that less to warn people with short attention spans, so much as to warn people that it's a film that really makes you sit and stew with all the emotions that are involved in trauma. Basically what I'm saying is, it is not a film for the faint of heart. Now, if you're still on board after all of those warnings, then I got some really good news for you because Violation is also fucking great. It's a meticulously crafted rape revenge film with a very interesting angle, and that angle is that it is told non-linearly. And it's the choice to tell the story that particular way that makes this movie really stand out. Because by showing us elements of the event's aftermath, before showing us the event itself, it allows us to examine our own preconceived biases. Take for example when the movie has other characters tell us their interpretation of what happened before we're shown what happened. And because of this, when you finally get to see what happened, you get an opportunity to examine why you believed X character when they said this, or why you believed Y character when they said that, or in some cases why you didn't believe. And also, by telling the story non-linearly, it also puts you in the head of a trauma victim yourself. One who is constantly reliving key trauma points as if they're happening in the here and now. Which is definitely something that's gonna hit home for a whole lot of people. Again, there is a reason why I issued a warning at the beginning of this vlog. I also really like the way this movie handled the revenge aspect of the rape-revenge formula. It doesn't really show it as a glamorous process. In this movie, it's way more of a grueling and almost traumatic experience in and of itself. We watch her throw up and have to work through panic attacks and have to clean up the mess. It's not a fun time. But I like that despite the process, by the end of this movie, she is in a better place than she started. Basically showing that the healing process is a long and grueling one with its own traumas along the way. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't try. Anyway, my fellow Gorehounds, if you think you can handle it, I highly recommend Violation. It is a true masterpiece of a film. But it's also a Shudder original movie, so if you want to watch the movie, you're going to have to watch it on that platform. And while I must stress I am not personally sponsored by Shudder, I do recommend the platform because it is ultimately, at the end of the day, a platform for horror fans by horror fans. So check the movie out there if you want to, and if you do, don't forget to come back here and go into the comments below and let me know what you thought of it. And with that said, my fellow Gorehounds, let us finally move on to the spoilers. Okay, so without getting bogged down in the tiny details, this is a story at its core about one woman, Miriam, who is raped by her brother-in-law. But like I mentioned earlier, this story is told non-linearly, which means pieces of the story are given to us out of order. For example, before we even get to see the crime in question, we first get to hear Miriam's sister, as well as her sister's husband's, interpretation of what happened that night. With Miriam's sister's husband, of course, being the brother-in-law in question. And the sister presents two possible interpretations of what happened that night, with the first being that none of it actually happened, and Miriam is merely making it up to ruin the sister's marriage. 
And the second interpretation the sister presents is that it did happen, but it was consensual, and Miriam also did this intentionally for the same aforementioned reason. And to be clear, at this point in the movie, all we've seen so far is this. We've seen that Miriam's relationship with her current husband is a little rocky at the moment. And we're talking like Rocky Five here, the bad kind of Rocky. We've also seen that her relationship with her sister has a lot of mutual resentment over things that happened in the past. With many of those things involving Miriam getting involved in her sister's business and her sister not being happy about this despite the fact that Miriam is doing it out of love. Because her first instinct when she sees her sister in trouble is to try to help her sister, which makes sense. But her sister resents her for this, and it's also pretty clear that there's a little bit of resentment under Miriam's surface as well. Like, it's really hard for Miriam to see her sister in such a happy, loving relationship given how rocky her own relationship is. And the third thing we've seen so far is that Miriam is actually pretty close to her sister's husband and actually confides in a lot of her issues with him because they used to be childhood friends. And during some of these confiding scenes, there was definitely some explosive chemistry on display that you could argue was flirting. So given that's all we've seen so far, it is entirely possible that you, the viewer, might be watching this movie and might be siding with the sister during these confrontations. Because there's certainly enough evidence that what the sister thinks happened that night might be true. And to add on to that, following that scene, we then get to hear the brother-in-law's interpretation of what happened that night. Basically, Miriam calls him to her cabin, and there's a heavy implication that the two of them are starting an affair. And during this scene, while she's seemingly seducing him, she asks him point blank, what happened that night? To which he describes a night of mutual passion in which he was touching her and she was moaning erotically, and then she told him, don't stop. But then after he describes how they had sex that night, she comes in with a baseball bat and knocks him the fuck out. There's a drive deep. You don't really think that you were gonna get through this without being punished now, did you? Which is such a holy shit moment. And at that point, I was sitting there going, no, now you need to show me what happened that night. I need to know what the hell is going on. And then the movie shows us what happened that night. And at first, it throws us for a real loop. It throws us for a real loop. It throws us for a real loop. Because at first it shows us Miriam and the brother-in-law confiding in one another and getting closer and closer until she initiates a kiss. And when that happens, you find yourself going, oh shit, maybe the sister and the brother-in-law's interpretation was correct after all. But then she pulls back from the kiss and apologizes because she can't be kissing her sister's husband. That's just all kinds of fucked up. And then the two of them fall asleep. And it's at this point that the brother's story is proven to be complete bullshit. Because his version of what happened that night leaves out some very important details like the fact that she was fucking asleep and either lies or completely misinterprets other details like her moaning erotically was her literally being asleep and just making noises. And his claim was she said, don't stop, but in actuality she said, Dylan, stop. As in Dylan, please stop what you're doing, I am not okay with this. And on top of that, she had trouble getting the rest of those thoughts out because she was drunk. So no, definitively, the brother-in-law fucking raped her. But I love that because it decided to reveal all this information out of order, it forces you as the viewer to examine your own biases about who you're believing and who you're not believing and why you're believing them. And it also demonstrates how sometimes having some evidence, but only a small amount of it, pointing you in one direction, can be even more dangerous than having no evidence, because if it points you in the wrong direction, then obviously, that's bad. Anyway, the rest of the movie involves Miriam killing the brother-in-law, and then disposing of the body in pretty elaborate ways. And what I really like about the way they handle the revenge portion of the movie is that it's not an easy process. Especially when he wakes up and starts fighting back and also the long, grueling process of her dismembering the body and grinding the bones and draining the blood. And all this shit makes her throw up and have panic attacks and freak the fuck out and break down crying. Because in its own way, the act of seeking this revenge is a traumatizing experience in and of itself. But before I talk about the very end and the brother-in-law getting his final just desserts, <laughs> I want to first talk about the animal metaphors that run throughout the film. 
You see, one of the first things we see at the very beginning of this movie is this slow motion footage of this wolf eating a dead rabbit. And at first glance, when I first saw that footage, my first thought was, okay, wolf equals rapist and rabbit equals victim. But my fellow gorehounds, I am here to tell you, I was fucking wrong. Because you see, this wolf and rabbit metaphor reappears later when Miriam is disposing of the brother-in-law's body. And this time it shows us the wolf burying the dead rabbit's body, or in other words, disposing of its body. Which makes Miriam the wolf. And just in case you didn't get the metaphor at that point in the movie, the movie later on actually goes out of its way to explain it. Because you see, later on, there's a scene in which Miriam's sister is skinning a dead rabbit. As the sister explains how learning to do that was a very important point of personal growth for her, because she used to be a vegetarian, but upon meeting her current husband, she has taken on eating meat. And because she decided to start eating meat, she came to the realization that if she's going to do this, if she's going to commit to the meat eating lifestyle, then she might as well learn to do the dirty work herself and not leave it to someone else to do for her. Actually face the horror of killing an animal yourself and then preparing its dead body. As opposed to, you know, just ordering a hamburger and then eating that hamburger and not thinking about where that meat came from. She felt she should face that horror, that trauma, face to face, on her own, and overcome it, and then come out the other end, a more complete person. Which, and I cannot stress this enough, is exactly what Miriam accomplishes with this revenge plot. Essentially, facing the horror of killing the brother-in-law, dismembering his body, and then disposing of the body, is ultimately Miriam's version of her sister's journey with the rabbit. And goddamn is it handled so fucking well in this movie. And now here's the point where I'm gonna spoil the very end of the movie, so if you do not want the very end of the movie spoiled, pause right here, stop, go watch the movie, come back, and then finish this vlog from this point forward. <laughs> Okay, so the final scene of this movie involves Miriam helping her sister out with this large gathering of her sister's in-laws. And thankfully, in these final scenes, her and her sister finally make up and reconnect after their fight they had earlier in the movie. And this happens while Miriam is making homemade ice cream for the in-laws. And this is juxtaposed with her grinding the brother-in-law's bones into dust. And then later we see as she watches the in-laws eating the ice cream with some tears running down her face until finally she smiles into the camera. And she smiles because the in-laws are now eating the brother-in-law. Now that's what I call a good for her ending. Anyway, Violation is a damn good rape revenge film, and if you think you could stomach it, I highly recommend checking it out over on Shudder. And as per usual, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and don't forget to ring that notification bell so that you're notified of my videos immediately upon their upload. And be sure to check out my Patreon page, and remember, if you decide to go the Patreon route, even a dollar a month can go a long way. And with that said, my fellow gorehounds, peace out, and I'll catch y'all later.